In this video, we introduce Kirchhoff's laws in the context of an example. So in this example circuit, we have two power sources, which is a pretty typical sort of circuit requiring Kirchhoff's laws. And the issue here is that our resistors are not in series or parallel. So the series and parallel formulas won't work for solving the circuit. Remember, series resistors, they need to be guaranteed to always have the same current running through them. And if you just look at the labeled currents in this circuit, you can immediately tell the resistors don't necessarily have the same current running through them. Likewise, parallel resistors, they need to be guaranteed to have the exact same potential difference across them always. And I can tell that that's not the case in this circuit either. So I would expect parallel resistors to be connected by wire uninterrupted by any other circuit elements at their top end and at their bottom end. And if I compare the 12 and 20 ohm resistors just as an example here, um, they're connected by wire uninterrupted by anything else on one side. But on the other side, there's a power source of three volts in the way, and that makes it so the potential difference is not the same across these two resistors. So we need a new tool to approach the circuit, and that's where Kirchhoff's laws come in. First, the sum of all the currents entering a node must equal zero. So if I look at this node right here, I would say all the current diving into that node must sum up to zero. Otherwise, charge would be building up in that node, and that can't happen. Um, and maybe a more intuitive way of saying this is that all the current going into a node must be equal to all the current coming out of the node. So current in equals current out. Kirchhoff's law number two, the sum of all the voltage changes around a closed loop must equal zero. And all we're saying here is like if you drove your car in a giant loop and came back to where you started, then the sum of all the elevation changes must be zero. So it's the same for an electric circuit. If you do a complete loop back to where you started, then you're at the same voltage you started at. So the sum of all the changes must be zero. A little bit of detail on calculating voltage changes as you traverse one of these loops in a circuit. If you cross a resistor in the same direction as the current, that's a voltage drop because current goes from the high side of a resistor to the low side. And the other way around, if you crossed a resistor in the opposite direction of the current, that would be a voltage increase. How do you get the magnitude of a voltage change across the resistor? We just use Ohm's law, V equals IR. And the second point here, if you cross a battery from the low to the high side, so if I look at the three volt battery, if I did this while I was traversing a loop, that would be an increase of three volts. If I went the other way, it would be a decrease. So we'll briefly talk strategy when we're solving Kirchhoff's law circuits. One, we label all the branch currents. So in our example, we have three branches, three distinct currents in the circuit. I called the current through the top branch, I1. I1 is exactly the same right here as it is through the top. And it's the same right here as well. There's no other options for current to get diverted as I traveled this branch. So that's how a branch is defined. So I label I1, and then in the middle branch, I have an I2. In the bottom branch, I have an I3. Note that you don't have to guess the correct direction of these currents before you actually do the calculations. If you get the direction wrong, it'll just come out with a minus sign out of the algebra. And that tells you the actual direction of the current is opposite to what you drew. Second, we use nodes and loops to generate equations using Kirchhoff's laws. Now in this example, I have three unknowns, so I better have three equations. Another important point is to make sure you include every single circuit element in one of your Kirchhoff's laws equations. It can't possibly be right if one of your circuit elements doesn't appear in the mathematics. And then third, we'll solve the system of equations. And I'm going to demonstrate one of these by hand in this video, but I'll also show how to use Maxima, that's a computer algebra system, or Wolfram Alpha to solve a system of equations. And one final little note, sometimes, especially if you're working on a really complex Kirchhoff circuit, you can end up with a huge list of equations and it's impossible to tell just by glancing at it, but maybe two of those equations could be combined to give you one of the other equations. That's what I would call internal dependence of the system. And basically that means like if you had six unknowns and six equations, but you had some internal dependence, that wouldn't be enough equations. And you would have to add one more equation in order to nail down the actual values of the currents. You'll notice that you end up with a free parameter in the solutions if this happens. And then you just have to write down an equation for another voltage loop, for example, and then reevaluate the system and it should nail it down. So let's actually solve one of these things. So the way I'm gonna start here is by labeling a node and using the node rule current in equals current out. And I can see that I1 and I2 are going into this node and I3 is coming out of it. So I immediately have my first equation. I1 plus I2 equal to I3. And then I started thinking about voltage loops and I like to index these. So I'm gonna do this little loop and I'll call that number one. And I'm gonna start right here from this bottom left corner. 
So the first thing I run into is an increase of three volts. The next thing I run into is a resistor with resistance 20 ohms and a current I3, and I'm going the same direction of the current, so this is gonna be a voltage drop of 20 ohms times I3. And the third thing I run into is another voltage drop again because I'm in the same direction as I2. That's a voltage drop of, again, given by Ohm's law, resistance times current, so 12 ohms times I2. And then I'm back where I started without going through any other circuit elements. And so there it is. The sum of the voltage changes on a closed loop must vanish. Then I'll look at this loop. And if you like, you could just do the loop that's around the outer edge of the entire circuit, but I'm going to have enough equations this way. And I'll go ahead and start at the lower left corner again, just because it's easy to keep track of if I do it the same way. And this time when I traverse the loop, I'm going the wrong way through the 12 ohm resistor, and that's an increase in potential. And for that, I get 12 ohms times I2, and I put a plus sign on it. The next thing I do is I go across this 18 ohm resistor in the same direction as the current, so that's a voltage drop, negative 18 ohms times I1. And the last thing I do before getting back to the beginning is I go from the low side to the high side of this 8 volt battery, so that's a plus 8 volts. And I'm back where I started, and the sum of the voltage changes is equal to zero. So there's where we are. So whatever way I do this, I want to clean it up first and, and kind of organize it. So what I'm going to do is arrange all the I's on the left-hand side of each equation, and I'm going to list them in order. So I have I1 plus I2 minus I3 is equal to zero. That's my first equation. In my second equation, I'm going to go ahead and add the 20 I3 and the 12 I2 to the right-hand side and then turn the thing around. So I have 12 I2 plus 20 I3 is equal to 3. And in my third equation, I'll go ahead and write it this way, negative 18 I1 plus 12 I2 is equal to negative 8. Okay, now that we've simplified this into this organized form where I'm not distracted by units and everything, I want to point out that if you plan to use a technological solution to the problem, go ahead and look in the description where I've labeled the chapters for this video and you can skip to where we use a computer algebra system to get this system solved. So I'm going to proceed to do this by hand, and you have a lot of options here. If you know some linear algebra, then you could use matrix methods to do this. What I'm gonna do is simplify the system in an order that's reminiscent of what you would do if you were row reducing a matrix. So I'm kind of hitting the intermediate algebra approach, but if you know a little bit of linear algebra, maybe you'll be able to think about it in terms of matrices. So the first thing I'm going to do here is eliminate the I1 from the third equation. And I'm going to take 18 times the first equation and add it to the third equation. And then I'll rewrite my system. So 18 I1 added to negative 18 I1. The whole point of this was to eliminate I1. So that's gone. And then I have 18 I2 plus 12 I2. That's 30 I2. And then I have negative 18 I3. And there were no I3s in the third equation. So I just have negative 18 I3. On the right-hand side, I have 18 times 0. Well, that's nothing. Add it to negative 8. So the negative 8 is still here. And the whole point of reducing in this form is that now I've got a system of two equations and two unknowns in the bottom half of this. And I should be able to eliminate the I2s from this. And then I'll be left with a solution for I3. And then I'm going to substitute back into the previous equations to find all the I's. So how do I eliminate I2? I've got to get a negative 30 I2 when I multiply by something. And things aren't so nice now. It's not an integer. It's negative 30 over 12. Of course, that reduces, but for now, I'm going to write it as 30 over 12 because it's easy to see the 12s cancel when I get a negative 30 I2. All right, so the plan is negative 30 over 12 times the second equation. Add that to the third equation. The first equation is left alone here. The second equation is left alone. But I'm going to take negative 30 over 12 times the second equation and add to the third. The whole point of that 30 over 12 is that when I multiply it by 12 I2, the 12s cancel and I get a negative 30 I2. When I add that to the 30 I2, I get no I2s. So that term eliminates and I'm left with just an I3 term. So my I3 term is going to require a lot of simplification, but I have negative 30 12s times 20 I3 minus the 18 that was already in equation 3. 
And then I also have to take negative 30 twelfths and multiply by the 3 on the right-hand side of equation 2. Negative 30 twelfths times 3. And I have also the negative 8 in equation 3 that I added to. So there's a lot of fraction simplification to do. Cancel a 6 out of the 12 and the 30, leaving me with a 5 in the numerator, 2 in the denominator. Cancel a 2 out of the 20, leaving me with a 10. This gives me negative 50 minus 18 i3 on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, I can cancel a 3 out of the 12, leaving me with a 4 in the denominator. And 30 over 4 reduces to 15 over 2. So I have negative 15 halves minus 8. Continuing to simplify, I have negative 68 i3 is negative 15 halves minus 16 halves. That's 8. So I get negative 31 halves. And when I solve for i3, I'm going to bail out of the exact fractions now and just write things as decimals to three sig figs. So I get 0.228 amps. So next I take this solution and I plug it back into equation two where I have 12 I two plus 20 I three. So I'm looking right here plus 20 I three is equal to three. And I can solve for I of two real quick in my calculator and I get negative 0 0.130 amps for this. Finally, I take I3 and I2 and I plug into equation number one, where I have I1 plus I2, well that was negative 0 0.130, minus I3, 0.228 is equal to zero, and I get 0 0.358 amps. So just a couple points before I show how to do this with a computer algebra system. One is that one of these currents came out with a minus sign on it and it's I2. I showed it to the left in my original picture, and what this means is I2 actually physically points to the right. The other point I want to make is that now that we know all the branch currents in the circuit, I can find the voltage drop over every single resistor, and then I could find the potential difference between any two nodes in the circuit, which is what we normally end up measuring in the lab, so that's a popular calculation. Okay, let's take a look at how to get this done with technology. The first piece of technology we're going to look at is WX Maxima. So this is an open source program. It's a free download. And I'll put a link to the download page in the description. And this is a computer algebra system, which means you're free to just give things names and then combine those names later. It's really convenient. So what I'm going to do is name each of these three equations real quick. OK, just a couple points about what I've done here. I gave the equations names, equation 1, 2, and 3. And my currents are written as, as I underscore 1, I underscore 2, I underscore 3. I put a semicolon after each equation, which is going to make Maxima repeat them to me after I enter them. And I pressed Enter to do all the line breaks. When I hit Shift Enter, these equations become defined in Maxima. And it will repeat them to us so we can check our work and make sure we wrote them correctly. Now we solve the system. So I've entered the solve command here, and when I'm doing a system of equations, I have to list those equations in brackets. So equation one, two, and three in brackets. Then I have to tell Maxima what variables I'm solving for, I1, I2, and I3. So that's all ready. But Maxima would give us an exact fractional solution on each current if we did this, and I really just want to compare my decimal answer to what I've already done, so I'm going to use the float command out in front of this. That gives us a decimal approximation, and then I hit shift enter. And I get my answers. I1 is 0.3578. That's 0.358, which is what we found when we did it by hand. I2 is negative 0.1299. In other words, negative 0.130. That's what we got by hand. And then I3 is 0.228 when I round it. And that's what I got by hand. So this is good. Maxima agrees with our work. All right, the second piece of technology I want to illustrate how to use is Wolfram Alpha. So I have students who prefer to use this over using a computer algebra system like Maxima. Wolfram Alpha has computer algebra built into it, and the syntax is a little bit more flexible. So when I'm on Wolfram Alpha, I'm usually just guessing what kind of syntax it would consider to be reasonable, and it just turns out to work almost always. So I'm going to enter my system of equations now. OK, I just zoomed in a little to make this easier to look at, but I just put in solve and then parentheses, and then I wrote each of the equations. I didn't worry about putting multipliers in, like 12i2. I think Wolfram Alpha will know that that means multiplication. And we'll hit enter and see what we get. All right, Wolfram produces exact fractional answers for us. And then I'm going to click on an approximate form. And I get 0.358 for I1, negative 0.130 for I2, 0.228 for I3. So this also agrees with the work that we did by hand. If you find the physics content on Zach's lab helpful, 
Click on the Zax Lab logo on the right to browse playlists and subscribe to the channel. I produce over 100 new videos per month, and subscribing is the easiest way to find new content. Thanks for watching.